We have here today Professor William Johnson from Michigan State University yeah. and uh, editor of Contagion and editor of two uh, book uh, series was kindly agreed to talk to us about Professor René Girard and his memories of uh, how he met René Girard and the time that he spent with René Girard. So let me start off by asking you, um, when did you first hear about Professor René Girard and uh, what you, drew you to him? Um. I was at um, I was at Michigan State University even, and uh, I started in 1970. And in 1973, one of Renee's students, Michael Coppish from uh, Hopkins, introduced um, um, invited him to come to campus. And there was another uh, former I think he was a student of his, but he knew him at Buffalo, Clint Goodson. And so he gave a couple of lectures, one on the plague. And I had read in advance out of Deceit, Desire, and the novel. I mean, he was very interesting, of course, uh, in reading him. And the, the uh, lecture on the plague was, uh, was just amazing. I was absolutely uh, soaked in uh, Northrop Frye. And I'm a modernist, and my, specialist was, my specialization was modern writing, especially James Joyce. And so what I got from Fry is the, the theory of modes, the declining hero from, from the gods to the modern hero. But uh, Northrop Fry was really a structuralist and never explained that, <laughs> why they were descending. And that's what Girard gave me. And it was just astonishing. And I remember uh, talking with him at a party at Michael Coppish's house. And I had uh, discussed Gerard with uh, someone in my department who had been a student of his at uh, Hopkins in the 50s. In fact, Gerard had been on his dissertation committee and he said, you know, how, how uh, difficult Gerard was and uh, uh, how, how happy he was to argue with people and so on. And I found him entirely different. He was so congenial at, at uh, Michael's party uh, for some reason, we were passing around a big bowl of grapes. And so he ended up holding the bowl of grapes and handing them out to us as we circled around him, three or four people. And he was, he was making my head explode by the things he said. You know, you know the way, the cryptic way he talks. But I, you know, I had started reading him and I followed his idea on the plague. And it was the missing link for what I wanted to say about modern writing. And so my head was rocking back and forth while he was talking. At the same time, he was so sweet tempered. So uh, that was my introduction to him. And since this was the uh, 70s, I had gone off to uh, Leeds University on an exchange and teaching Shakespeare. And so I was reading up on uh, uh, Rene and read uh, La Violence. And so I, you know, I had one of the first tryouts on reading Shakespeare through Girard because we were reading the histories. Uh, which, you do, which even in the, in the Shakespeare book, he really doesn't talk about. And they are so ready to be read that way. And I, I still don't quite know what my uh, students up in Yorkshire <laughs> thought, of, thought of this way of reading. But uh, so that, that got me hooked. And so as a, as a scholar working on the modern, I kept using Renee's ideas. And occasionally I would uh, meet him at a conference or something, but I didn't really work with him in detail until uh, the, uh, someone invited me to come to cover. And that was in 1995. That was the first time I had, you know, uh, talked to him at length. And so I would see him at cover thereafter. And then when he and Bob Hamilton Kelly started up Imitatio, I was invited to join as uh, uh, the person involved in uh, publications. And so th that was still more time with him. And uh, that's, that's when somehow my life shifted from being a mar modernist to a Girardian. <laughs> it's been good, it's been good. So would you call yourself a modernist Girardian now? Yeah, that's right, that's right. That's what Andrew McKenna calls me anyway. <laughs> modernist yeah. Girardian, that's a little yeah. bit of a paradox though, isn't yeah. it? Uh, no, no, it works out just fine. It does? <laughs> I don't have any paradoxes to worry about at all. It's perfect. Okay. Uh, that they, they explain each other. I see. Good. Um, 
do you have any uh, good memories you can share with us uh, from the time you were working with Renee? Um, well, he's so fast. Uh, this was, this would have been, oh, maybe uh, 2007, something like that. And he'd already been, you know, retired for more than 10 years. And uh, we were sitting next to each other listening to a lecture at uh, Palo Alto. Um, and uh, not a public lecture, but it was one of these uh, round table things that uh, Hammerton, Robert Hammerton Kelly set up. And I'd been reading Ibsen. I, I, part of my book on modernism, violence and modernism covers Ibsen. And so I'd been re I'm reading him in Norwegian and working out. And I, I remember this something that Gerard had uh, tracked through his own writing, the idea of the gift. And so I said, you know, in, uh, in Norwegian, uh, gift, already gift means, uh, are you married? So to add to the other ideas of gift, you know, and I'm so proud of this because I worked on this and, uh, you know, we're listening to a lecture and then he just turned to me and says, oh yeah, gifted. <laughs> you know, his mind at that page, you know, at that place was running so fast. So that's my experience of him really, that he says these uh, wonderful things that uh, God knows how his mind really worked, but he would condense it so fast. And this isn't something I heard him say but it was something I read of his, you know, I was, uh, when, but before um, cover, I did go to the uh, conference in 1982, the Disorder Order Conference, and that was tremendous. Jean-Pierre Dupuis brought, I don't know how many <laughs> Nobel Prize, everybody was famous except me. <laughs> I mean, I recognized all these names except my own. And, uh, they what what Jean Pierre did was connect up uh, Girard's ideas about uh, moving from disorder to order to uh, to these these uh, powerful other ideas of physicists and so on. But I just recently read this quote where where, where uh, Rene was asked uh, about where order comes from, and he said, "Well, disorder. Where else would it come from?" <laughs> so you sit with that for about five seconds, and you say, "That's how his mind works." <laughs> you know, I mean that these uh, these other Nobel Prize winners like Ilya Prigogine and so on, they have this wonderful scholarship of uh, and research about how order emerges from disorder. <laughs> but Schreier says, "Well, where else would it come from?" <laughs> right. So uh, there are, there are so many little stories like that. It's just a um, a different mind. Uh, he he um, violence in the sacred. I mean, where in heaven's name did that come from? That just moves so fast that, uh, and, and you can retrace, and we published uh, a kind of biography of uh, Gerard by Cynthia Haven. And uh, uh, it, it still doesn't explain how his mind incorporated that material, the, the material of myth and, and uh, archaic cultures and, and uh, anthropological studies and so on. That, uh, that's, that's just amazing, that's just amazing. I remember you had asked me before about, did I have a favorite book? And f somehow, maybe it's because of the work I do. I'm always working on Girard and doing my teaching and so on. So uh, most times he just gives me what I need. <laughs> so if I identify a book, I'm working. I was just reading The Scapegoat, Bouquet Messer. I wanted to read it at the, in the, uh, the Rouge edition, the red edition, you know, the one he, he put together. And... Uh, uh, I, I, you know, I would say uh, with a proper sense of self-deprecation, I missed a lot, <laughs> but it was giving me just what I needed. And so, uh, you know, on the one hand, I get a bad grade for missing a lot, but, <laughs> you know, who, I mean, who cares? Because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm getting just what I need to do the work I'm doing now. Why do you say you're missing a lot? I don't get that. Uh, In what sense that are you missing a lot? Missing a lot. Well, um, I must have missed a lot because there was a lot of stuff in there that looks like it's new to me. And it, it probably just means I wasn't ready to use all of it at any one time. Oh, I see what you mean. So, right. you know, that, that book always seemed to me uh, Girard's um, address to the misunderstandings that followed his work. And there's a kind of urgency in that book, I think, that, that comes from, you know, how can you not understand this? <laughs> you know, where he switches over to the text of persecution and just says simply, look at how we all read this. 
Is there anybody that doesn't read them this way that the witches are not guilty, the Jews are not guilty? Well, just switch that reading over to myth. Why aren't we reading myths that way when we recognize the same structure reappearing? So, I mean, I got that, but there are all these beautiful things in there. And, you know, you would know this, sometimes the English translations just drop things out. Um, so Deshaus Cache, there's all kinds of things that are dropped out of there, like his comments on Faulkner and race. And uh, in the case of uh, Bouc Emissaire, there's some beautiful passages on Sophocles, where he claims Sophocles as a more, more ardently or strongly as a fellow researcher who's, who's wondering whether these myths are not told in the correct way. You know, that they, so, so that the, the criticism of Girard that he had um, uh, chosen uh, cherry picked Sophocles, he turns that argument inside out and says that it's not me, it's Sophocles gathering material, enough material about the myth to make you wonder what, what it's about, what its, what its motive is. So for me, I just keep going from text to text. <laughs> from text to text, from book to book. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So uh, in all these years, I guess 70, you said uh, you encountered your art. In all these years, uh, what's your favorite book of his? Uh, you, you have know, one. I, yeah, but, I think but, if I, I, my uh, first answer is I really don't have one. I okay. have different reasons for admiring them. Violence in the sacred is so sudden and so powerful and so beautifully written. It's almost like a detective novel, the way he spins it out. And he's been criticized, of course, by uh, Eric Hans for not putting his, his theory of desire up front and just, you know, work walking out of deceit, desire on the novel straight to violence in the sacred. Right. But I think it's such a powerful book because it has a new subject, that violence is a bigger subject than desire. You know, there are, there are uh, occasions of violence uh, that only have minimally to do with desire. They're fighting over real things and uh, not drawn to them by desire, but necessity. And uh, Girard's analysis of violence includes those as well as the occasions uh, created by desire. So, I mean, so I, I agree with, with the organization as well as these, they're, they're, um, they're it's so, pithy in a way that he will just pick up because you know this uh, I, I suppose if you're doing a biographical approach this, this is a very com not combative he said combative but I think it's uh, he's willing to engage with anybody and there there are those videos you can see on the uh, French in the French group the R ARM group connect and he's leaning into these discussions <laughs> he's chin in <laughs> you know and happy to argue about these things so uh, the, the way he flips Levi Strauss, and this isn't fair. I mean, I read Levi Strauss along with uh, Northrop Fry, I have immense admiration for him, as does Girard. But he, he just catches somebody and turns them upside down. So when Levi Strauss says uh, the myth always, you know, uh, accounts for the so-called biological facts, and he just flips them over and says these biological facts come from you know the the sternness of uh, ritual and taboo <laughs> that it's only when uh, women's for example sexual behavior is is uh, regulated you could even discover the so-called biological facts so it's 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 delightful in that way and I remember as well the flipping of uh, Freud in favor of the child the last to learn that he's. <laughs> wants to kill his father and marry his mother. Right. So maybe maybe that's a favorite because it's so, it's, uh, there's so much in there without it being overwritten. It's just beautifully written. That's true. Yeah. Very subtle and uh, very precise. Yeah. He's, he's always been very precise with his writing. Yeah. Very, so, so that's true. Um, did you also know, I guess it's uh, redundant to ask, you probably, do you have any memories of Martha Girard? Of course, of course, yeah. Uh, I really like her. Uh, I met her first in uh, Chicago. There was a conference there, part of the uh, School of Criticism at Northwestern. And uh, just, to, just to me to say hello, but uh, 
during the, the times of cover that would meet once a year, I would, uh, we would sit together, the four of us, my wife and I, Rosemary and uh, Martha and Renee. And um, if it was ever going to be possible to have a, not a normal, but a kind of um, unfussed relation to Renee, it was during those times, we just sat at a picnic table and talking about stuff. And, uh, but the, you know, the hard part of Gerard is, is to be dumbfounded by him. That his, his work is so remarkable and say, this man's, a, this man's a genius, how do I talk to him? And, and she was really good for, for um, and, she, and she's a really cool woman, you know, I really like her. And uh, I, still, I still keep in touch with her. And when we're anywhere near California, I go up and uh, visit her. Uh, it, she's, um, she's one of a kind, you know, she's, um, I can't imagine what um, I can't imagine what it was like. I mean, it's there in the biography about how they met and so on, but still, he's a handful, and and uh, his, his um, one one way you can read Martha is the way Renee always treated her. She was always treated with respect. She was his partner, and they would talk together. I think sometimes she say to him. I remember one time, this was at Canada where she started bugging him. She said, you didn't prepare enough to say that, <laughs> you know, that he hadn't, hadn't done it. He hadn't uh, been respectful enough, I suppose you would say, of his ideas. So she was the real thing. I mean, she was, um, she, she still is the real thing, but she was uh, involved in, in his thinking. And I remember once we, uh, my wife and I were both in cover at that time, Rosemary, my wife, Rosemary. And she had invited, invited Martha to be on a panel to talk about uh, Renee's work. She thought about it for a long time and, and uh, decided not to. And, and uh, um, I, I wish we had talked her into it. I, I would love to have heard that, but at the same time, I, I, I respect that. You know, I, don't, I don't even have the words to describe you know, uh, what my respect is looking at, what I am respecting, but I, do, I think I understand it. I think I have a f kind of feeling for why she did, decided finally not to. Because she said, yeah, well, I know a lot about it. <laughs> this was at a cover conference? Yeah, that was a cover conference. It was, uh, it would have been- After Renee has passed away? No, no, it was before, but he wasn't, uh, uh, until, I don't remember what the subject of the panel was. It was before he passed away. Okay. Right. Right. I see. Okay. Do you remember um, any moment when you were talking with Rene, which was not about anything profound, something down to earth? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. There's a, there's a wonderful picture of... Uh, Renee with my wife, Rosemary, there was, uh, we were at this conference in Canada and we were at some kind of dorm and the food was terrible. <laughs> we were talking about how terrible the food was. And he wasn't mean or critical or anything or it wasn't anything like I'm French and this food is terrible. It was just, you know, any any place on the planet you did, it wasn't good. And uh, he was, he was uh, I remember once when we were at, uh, we were in New Mexico at uh, Ghost Ranch, and uh, it was it was a good it was a good time because people had time to talk to each other. We were all in the same place, and nobody was driving off going anywhere else. And uh, uh, Renee came up in a in a, a rented car, a Jaguar. That Bobby and Renee Kelly, who always traveled in a high style, had rented a Jaguar, so they came up in the Jaguar and they got out. And Renee's wearing jeans, you know. <laughs> So he's wearing blue jeans. And um, so, you know, they came up and we were talking to them and they were handing out drinks and, and uh, somebody handed them a bottle of Budweiser, you know, and uh, Maria Stella Barberi, who's a wonderful woman uh, from Sicily, you know, she's someone who's done a lot of work on Gerard, very smart woman. And she says, she says, Professor Gerard or Rene Gerard is a Frenchman. You can't just hand him a bottle of Budweiser. And he he tipped it back so elegantly and drank from it. He looked like the Marlboro man with his jeans on and drinking a bottle. You know what I mean? It was 
it was uh, it was easy. It, he was easy at being okay and uh, down to earth, you know. Yeah. Wasn't, are, wasn't trying to flash anybody or impress anybody, you know. Yeah. What are some of the traits that you would uh, attribute to Rene? Um, when you first met him, what? How did he strike you? Was he uh, the big giant intellectual that you? had imagined him to be? Well, you know, a part of it, I would be going back that first time I met him when I had been prepared, I thought to meet him that he was difficult. And uh, reading between the lines and the way he talked about himself his early days, I think he says about himself that he, would, he had uh, done too much to form a clique at Hopkins, you know, that made a break between the older faculty and uh, and Renee and fellow students and so on. And I think it's out of that period that my colleague in the English department, uh, Bernie Paris was his name, very good man. And he had prepared me out of that, that this man is difficult and he might go after you and so on. And so my first ex experience was not at all so friendly, so kind, handing me grapes while he's giving me, you know, my reading plan for the next 50 years. So, uh, I, I mean, that, that continued. I, um, that actually that meeting we were at, <laughs> if you remember, right. that fool who uh, started accusing us of being some clique or, or uh, uh, you know, some, some kind of groupies around Gerard. And uh, then I think it was Sandy Goodhart who asked him, asked Renee, who was sitting in the audience, he says, uh, well, you have a chance to answer this. And uh, Rene said, just said, I do not recognize myself in the person he's describing. And that was so cool. That was so cool. I remember how hot you were. <laughs> I remember that you were ready to go. <laughs> I think I, 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 either I said, we should probably just sit here because I could feel you <laughs> edging up towards the, <laughs> towards the microphone. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that stands for him that even at a place where he could have said, you know, what are you talking about, you know, and um, that was so, it was unkind, it was rude. He was an invited guest to talk about Gerard and, you know, to say those things. And uh, was he the Johnny one? Vatimo, Johnny Vatimo, as, as you remember, got up and said in his part of the talk and said, uh, well, you know, Rene doesn't need anybody to defend him. <laughs> uh, so that was another way of settling it. So those are, I suppose those are the points I think of when you ask about what he was like, you know. Right. Okay. Very good. Um, so what are your, um, what are your current projects and future projects you have uh, in terms of um, <coughs> continuing with uh, Rene Girard's work? Do you have anything specific? Any books you want to write or in addition to your editing? Yeah, yeah. Well, I want, uh, you know, the editing, of course, comes first. And I, I see it as being <laughs> much more effective than my own writing. That's just the, <laughs> that's just the truth. That's the way it goes. So we're right now, uh, we're, the, the series continues. So we publish about four books a year, ideally two books in the breakthrough series and two books in the studies and violence, mimesis and culture. Right now, the very thing I'm working on is uh, uh, we got the rights to a, uh, an amazing conversation that Rene had in 1972 in the offices of Esprit in Paris. This was published in Esprit, and it's, uh, it's the place where he comes out of uh, violence and the sacred. You remember he did add, he, he took out the parts on the Bible as being, uh, I think he wanted to defend them more properly, a little worried that be taken out of context. But there in the discussion, he just lays it all out. And it, it's stupendous. And it's one of those places where he's taking out all comers. There's about five or six different interlocutors, Pierre Pache and so on, and others who just lean in and ask questions. And he just keeps hitting it out of the park. And so this has never been translated. So Andrew McKenna, one of his early students, has translated it into English. And uh, Andreas Wilmes, who's very strong young uh, uh, Girard scholar has written a preface to it. So we'll publish that probably fall of uh, 2021. Giuseppe Fornari's books, uh, two books, two volumes, this is huge. It's just uh, his version of a medic theory 
beginning from practically the archaic world up to present time that will appear maybe in the next month, six weeks or so on. So he's, Fornari is really important as, uh, oh, I was going to talk about my work, right? I wasn't going to talk about editing. <laughs> so my editing, my, my writing very simply, what I'm working on now is a kind of uh, second step or stage from my first book. My first book was Violence and Modernism. And I did Ibsen, Joyce, and Virginia Woolf. And this, and, and that tried to amalgamate Northrop Fry with Girard, you know, to try to uh, uh, establish what, how it was that the modern comes at the end of this period of, whether you call it deconstruction or uh, disenchantment or whatever. And this next book is on, uh, I'm going to try to amalgamate uh, Edward Said and uh, Rene Girard. And I, I remember a discussion we had. Because uh, I was asking you, I figured out since you had worked in uh, Saeed's department, I said, well, how exactly do you reconcile those? Because Saeed wasn't very good on Gerard. You would never go to Saeed and find out what Gerard was doing. He just washed his hands of it. But you told me, and I remember this very well, I'm going to put it in my introduction, because I thought you would, you would tell me something technical. And instead you said, Edward Saeed was our hero. And I'll never forget that. And he was... Uh, <clears throat> he was my hero too. I mean, I met him in the 60s at Illinois. He was there at the Center for Advanced Study. And so I'll be writing about uh, Conrad. The idea is to use uh, Gerard and Said to extend the reading, to continue the reading that Said was uh, doing of Conrad. Because I think he was almost at the point where he could reckon, uh, he could say more in defense of Conrad than he had just dated colonialism. Because I think if you look at Conrad's work very carefully, he's doing much more. He's showing how colonialism is exploding of itself. And it wouldn't disappear by itself. It, it requires pressure from others. It's, a, it's the necessity of taking opportunity of, in a moment of weakness of colonialism because it could have sewed itself up back again, but it didn't. And so I think that's where Conrad comes in. So it's on Conrad and Achebe. So Things Fall Apart seems to me perfectly the, the, the perfect novel for the post-colonial because everything is in it. He is, he is an anthropologist in, in Rene's sense, you know, showing how, and showing how things fall apart. Um, and then finally, uh, the, the third person I'm writing about is Dermot Bolger, who's an Irish writer, not much known in uh, in the United States. And I think he, he is the best example I can think of who talks about, uh, he's very much against post-colonialism. I mean, he says that this is just a straight jacket thrown on Irish writers. They should have nothing to do with it. You know, just taking these ideas that have been worked out somewhere else and just stamping them. And so his version of being Irish is very loose if you're if you were once in Ireland, you're Irish. <laughs> if you're living there now, if you're Polish or Hungarian, emigre, you're Irish. And he says in the preface to his a, a series of three plays he wrote about public housing in Dublin, uh, um, he says that um, every movement has to, and, and, and say so just you know lays this out in, in culture and imperialism that every movement has to talk about how it's been hurt. But you have to go there first. You have to say, this is how I've been hurt. And he talks, he quotes Fanon about how you need to move on, of course, if you, you can't just stay there. And that's, that has a lot of resonance in Irish culture, that they themselves criticize themselves for always talking about the troubles in our native land, all the sufferings and doing the poor mouth. And Bolger's so good at that because he says that there's a time where you have to move on and create a new Ireland. You have to leave that stuff behind. So um, we'll see how it works out. That sounds fascinating. But, well, yeah, it's really good. It's good for me. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, nevertheless, I probably spend 75 or 80% of my time on uh, doing the editing. Right. And I can see how this has influence, has effect. And uh, my writing, well, I'd love to make that case for Conrad because I love Conrad and it's so easy to beat him up. If, you know, at, uh, I wrote an essay, published an essay in Conradiana in 2003, the same year my book came out on his uh, third novel, the one he said made him a writer. Right. And uh, it uses the N word in the title. And that's been the kiss of death, you know, for that book. 
Uh, so, uh, and then I, I, I deal with the Chebe's criticisms of Conrad, which I, I refuse to quarrel with the Chebe, but I think there's a point that you go beyond that, that the first person that recognizes the insults to uh, the racist insults is Conrad himself, especially in that third novel. What did you think of um, Apocalypse Now, the film? Did you ever see that? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, I, uh, it's just different. I don't. I don't think it has much to do with Conrad. No. You know, uh, I published uh, 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 Nijesh Latu's book on Conrad. Very, very successful book. It got the uh, Conrad Award from the Conrad Society for the best book on Conrad for a two-year period, and he goes into that at length. But uh, uh, it, you know, it, it it's. Uh, it's a cool movie, you know, a very uh, effective movie, I, but I don't, uh, but it's not I don't spend time thinking about them together. Right, know. right. Yeah. This is a footnote. Uh, Edward Said was at the conference that uh, Girard organized in Johns Hopkins. Did you know that? That's right. That's right. Yeah. You can see that in the, in the comments. In the comments. Get a lot of it. He probably said more than that, you know. So. That was there. Good. Well, he was a hot shot even then. I mean, you know, I mean, even, even, um, I mean, it's right out of grad school. Yeah. And it's, it's too bad that they didn't spend more time on each other's work because, in some ways, they're alike. They're uh, two scholars who were not um, fireballs when they were young students. And you get the impression that Saeed just, goofed off a lot or, or felt so at odds with his education that it wasn't until, you know, really he had writing his dissertation that, that people could see how incredible he was. Right. Yeah, you know, I, I admired him because he never made a, he never, um, he wasn't someone who kept changing jobs in order to increase his, uh, you know, whatever, his salary or his influence or whatever, he just stayed at Columbia, that was fine. That's that's remarkable, very rare. And what they both had in common was they were both out of place. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's a quote. I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were both out of place. <laughs> yeah, she made a real career out of being out of place, and so did Saeed. So, yeah. so yeah. yeah, I miss them both. I miss them both. You know, it seems like we're living in a world now where where uh, Edward Saeed isn't. That's as simple as I can say it. Right. Wonderful. So, well, I'm really happy and very excited for all the work you're doing because I, I spoke to uh, Giuseppe Fornari and he told me about the book that he was- Oh, editing. good, oh, good, yeah. So he, he was very happy and very excited about the book. Uh, so he told me, and now you're telling me about the book, so I'm looking forward to seeing it yeah. when it comes out. So okay. that's wonderful, so. That's great, well, that's great. Well, no, thank you very much for taking the time to talk and share your memories and thoughts on René Girard, uh, Professor René Girard, I would say, and I hope to see you soon.